Hello and welcome to the home of the Ghost Owl, continuing with Warhammer the Old World rulebook content. We're now on the final part of the combat phase, which essentially bring would bring us to the end of the main part of the rules section, as in the basics to play the game before you start getting on to uh, the more specific uh, individual rules and, and in reality more advanced rules. So let's finish up the combat phase. So we've looked at rolling to hit, to wound, who can fight. We've looked at uh, the uh, the combat itself and uh, how you calculate the winner looking at the combat resolution. So next up uh, we saw that the loser um, in the battle would have to take a break test. So looking at the break test itself. Now, to take a break test, you roll 2d6 and add the difference between the winner and loser's combat uh, result uh, scores. So you compare the total to the unit to the losing unit's leadership. So you say you roll 2d6, and if the winner uh, won by two points, you would add two to that 2d6 result, and that gives you a, um, a, uh, a score which you compare against the leadership. Now, if the natural roll is higher than the unit's leadership, the unit breaks and flees as described in the movement phase. So if just the dice result is higher than your leadership, you break and flee. If the natural roll is lower, but the modified result is higher, the unit falls back in good order. So your, your dice roll is lower than the leadership, but when you add the difference of the combat result, it is higher than the leadership. That's when you get full back in good order. However, important to note, if the winning side has more than double the unit strength of the loser, the loser will break and flee instead. And if the total modified result, so the dice roll and the additional combat result, is lower than the unit's leadership, or they roll a natural double one, the unit gives ground as described in the movement phase. Now, if a unit is surrounded and unable to break contact, the unit's movement stops immediately, and the units instead remain in place, locked in combat as if it had been a draw. Follow up and pursuit. So once a break tests have been made, but before the losing unit gives ground or makes a flea roll, the winning unit must decide whether to restrain and reform, follow up, or pursue. So if you're going to restrain and reform, most units can attempt to restrain and reform. Uh, and to do so, they must take a leadership test. Now, if they fail that test, they must either then follow up or pursue. However, if they do pass the test, the unit will remain in place and may make a free reform move. If you're following up, a unit can make a follow-up uh, if the enemy unit gives ground. Simply move the unit back into base contact with the enemy unit, and they remain locked in place until the next combat round. Before making a follow-up move, uh, a unit may change facing using the free turn, using a free turn manoeuvre, so that's turning up to 90 or even 180 degrees. And then when it comes to pursuit, when a unit makes a pursuit move, you pivot about its centre so that it is facing directly towards the enemy unit. You roll 2d6, the result is the distance in inches. If a unit destroys the enemy before the break test subphase, and does not restrain and reform, it may overrun. This is a normal pursuit move made directly forward. So you've wiped out an enemy, um, you haven't restrained and reformed, so you're overrunning, uh, but there's no option to pivot. You just go straight forwards the number of inches that you rolled. Now, units may be unable to follow up or pursue if they are still engaged in combat with another unit or due to the presence of other friendly units or terrain. So if due to this, so if it's due to terrain, uh, the unit moves as far as possible before halting. Okay, so continuing, lots of things to consider when you're pursuing. If the pursuing unit makes contact with the pursued unit, it has caught the enemy and halts. 
If the enemy unit was fleeing, um, it is immediately destroyed and removed from play. If the enemy um, falls back in good order, the units become engaged in combat once more, and the pursuing unit will count as charging in the next combat round. Pursuing units must stop if making contact with friendly units or terrain. And if a pursuing unit makes contact with or crosses the edge of the battlefield, it is removed from play but is not destroyed. The unit will then return to the battlefield during its next compulsory move subphase as if it were a reinforcement. If a pursuing unit makes contact with another enemy unit, it will become engaged in combat and you will wheel to a line as normal and count as charging in the next combat round. If a pursuing unit makes contact with another enemy unit that is also fleeing, that unit is destroyed and removed from play and the pursuing unit may then attempt a, f a reform move. If a pursuing unit makes contact with another enemy unit that is itself already engaged in a combat, the unit will become engaged in that combat. Now, if that combat has not yet been resolved in this turn, the pursuing unit will be able to fight a second time. It cannot pursue a second time, however, so if it wins the combat, it will not pursue a second time. It will instead automatically restrain and reform with no test required to do so. If combat has already taken place, it will become locked in combat until the next combat round and will count as having charged. So that covers the, the main parts then of combat up to this point. So you've identified who can fight, you've rolled the dice to see what casualties, you've removed the casualties, you've done the combat result, identified the winner, and then identified what the winner and the loser are doing, whether they're falling back, giving ground, whether you're pursuing or following up. So that is the main part of the combat phase done. However, there are some sort of specific oddball rules out there as well. Um, so you've got assailment spells. The assailment spells are cast as normal when it is the wizard's turn to fight. So these are specific spells that are, can only be done in the combat phase. And um, that's also determined by initiative order. So when it's the wizard's turn uh, to fight in initiative order, he can cast his assailment spell. Now, if hits caused by assailment spells use a template they are distributed among the rear ranks of the enemy unit and therefore do not reduce the number of models in the fighting rank that's quite important shrinking units as units take casualties they will of course reduce in size and may no longer be in base contact with the enemy units you need to move them the smallest possible amount to bring them back into base contact. However, you cannot use this to alter a facing, uh, redress the ranks, or engage another unit. If it is not possible to bring a unit back into combat, it ceases to be part of the combat at the end of the turn. Sometimes you may have incomplete ranks if a unit is fighting to its flank or rear, or it is joined by a character that does not neatly fit in the ranks. Um, it means the fighting rank might be incomplete. In this case, the fighting rank is assumed to contain the same number of models as the largest rank or file behind it. If you have split profiles, i.e. a character riding a monster, they will attack in the appropriate initiative order. So sometimes the character will attack first, then it could be an enemy uh, model, and then it could be uh, the mount ridden by the character. Uh, and in some cases, only one part may attack before it's destroyed. So if the character attacks and then is subsequently destroyed before the mount gets to attack, the mount does lose those attacks. Different weapons, sometimes models will be armed with different weapons in the same unit, 
uh, whether it's characters that have joined or, or, or else. Uh, therefore, different batches of dice must be rolled for the to hit and wound, and also making it clear to the opponent which weapon each batch of dice represent before the dice are rolled. If you have a characteristics of zero, so if you have a weapon skill of zero, it will automatically miss all of its attacks and will in turn itself be automatically hit. If a model has zero attacks, it simply cannot attack. Now, how does terrain affect combat? Well, open ground and hills. Open ground is the ideal setting for combat. However, as with shooting, hill placement should be carefully considered due to the advantage it can bring. So shooting, you get an advantage for hills. Combat, you get an advantage for hills. Therefore, you know, you could uh, very easily upset some balance on the table if uh, one opponent had access to more hills, for example, they were in their deployment zone or very close to their deployment zone. Um, so I think it should be very carefully considered um, that it's either um, very clearly in the middle of no man's land or very clearly out on the flank so that each uh, army has the option to get to that advantageous point or that if there is a hill in one of uh, one person's deployment zone, there should also be a hill in the other person's deployment zone and should be matched. So um, unless you're playing specific scenarios, of course, but it should be very carefully considered because hills do give uh, some quite decent advantages, both in shooting and in combat. Difficult terrain is 25% or more of a unit's models are within difficult terrain. At the start of combat, it is disrupted and cannot claim a rank bonus. Dangerous terrain and woods, these are both considered the same as difficult terrain for the purpose of combat. And then impassable terrain, if a charging unit is unable to align, it makes a disordered charge. And if a unit cannot align once contact has been made, which basically means there's a gap between the two units, uh, the charging unit also becomes disrupted. Linear obstacles, low linear obstacles, so these are like hedges, fences, walls that are less than two inches in height, causes units that straddle the object to become disrupted. However, you can have defended low linear obstacles. This is when um, the charge target is in base contact, but not straddling the obstacle. The charging unit will move into base contact with the linear obstacle and makes a disordered charge unless it has the fly special rule. High linear obstacles, two inches higher or more, are treated as impassable terrain. Battlefield decoration, these are small decorative elements less than two inches across. Could be anything from things like signposts or a little well or, or all sorts of just very small decorative things essentially should be ignored for the purpose of combat or if they're in the way of um, units that are moving to a line and, and becoming base-to-base -base contact just move the decorative element out of the way um, uh, so that positioning can, can take place as normal and then just replace it when the space becomes free. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of the combat phase. It brings us to the end of the four main phases of the game. That's the basics of playing Warhammer the Old World. Right, the absolute basics. And there's stuff in there that you can play just with these rules just to practice things out. However, what we are could be coming on to next is we're going to be looking at things like the psychology. We're going to be looking at universal special rules. We're going to be looking at how characters interact. We're going to be looking at weapons and armor, war machines, the laws of magic. So that's where you're starting to get into all of what um, both the rule book and I would agree uh, would fit into the more advanced rules of the game, covering more of the situations uh, that you can find yourselves in. But we've now covered essentially the base part of the rules in the main rule book. I hope you found this video and the series so far useful. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Let me know why in the comments down below. And as always, if you want to see more content, hit that subscribe button. It's free for you to do. 
It's a big deal for me, so thank you for that in advance. You've been watching The Ghost Hour. Tune back in when we take a look at some psychology in Warhammer The Old World. Thank you.